Saga bent down to inspect the body on the table. Somehow it felt familiar. The straps, the heart, the mutilated corpse laying on the rain-soaked wood. Like deja vu. She chased the source of the feeling. Found nothing. None of the victims from her past cases resembled this one. It didn't feel like anything from her past. More like something from a dream. From a life she could barely remember. Maybe one that wasn't even hers. Then the feeling passed. Like a shadow in the trees shifting with the wind. Saga blinked. Shook the feeling from her head. She turned her focus back on the work. There was a lot to do. Casey and the deputy were watching her. She had a feeling this would be an exciting case. The victim was one of their own. FBI Special Agent Robert Nightingale. Gone missing here 13 years ago. Now he had suddenly turned up only to be murdered in a brutal ritual on the very day of their arrival. And then there was the page. This page. The first page that they had found. Not the last. The first step down into terrifying depths. Secret truths trembling beyond the threshold. Reading the words. These words. Felt like a message. Was a message. Someone knew they were here. What they were doing. Someone playing a game with them. Leading them on. An invitation. How could they not accept? The sheer audacity of this impossible mystery presented to them. Even if they knew it would end up hurting them. The 81st annual Deer Fest was just around the corner. Everyone in Bright Falls was bustling. There were banners to be hung, pies baked, deer masks sold. Bright Falls had made the top 100 American small town lists for its modest rustic charm. The town expected a lot of tourists this year, but a shadow hung over the Deerfest preparations. The forecast promised rain. Fearful whispers promised more murders. The police were on high alert. Sheriff Breaker had deputies patrolling the streets at night. Bright Falls was no stranger to odd happenings. But to cancel Deerfest? Out of the question. The townsfolk were anxious. Their anticipation mixed with fear. People had restless dreams. The light seemed dimmer. Flood water pressed in on the town. And the shadows poured in with it. The autopsy room was a mess, like a bomb had gone off. Nightingale hunted Saga. Didn't see her under the light, lurched past her. The Taken could not see into bright light. The light hurt them. Hurt the darkness in them. Made them vulnerable. I flick the switch. It goes click. Show me the clicker. Lights are off, but somebody's home. Hemingway brought you here, witch. Get out of my house, Nightingale shouted. A wave of terror crashed through Saga's head. The awful truth. Nightingale had no heart in his chest, but here he was, killing a monster. The world had lurched out of balance. You found yourself trapped on the far side of the mirror. Saga was back at Cauldron Lake. He was there too, Nightingale. Was, but wasn't a taken, a creature of darkness. He was beyond her reach, where some other strange reality, the dark place, merged with ours. This place and the dark place, a tarp thrown over top, drowning everything beneath it, a flood of darkness, soaking into everything, spoiling it, rotting it. The page called this area an overlap. Saga had to pursue Nightingale into the overlap. Finding a way in would be difficult, required precise steps, a ritual. Saga would learn how. Stop the monster before he killed again. Her job. He'd be inside, waiting for her. The reality-changing influence of the dark place flowed like water flowed. Like fear flowed. Down the path of least resistance, eroding the weak spots until they cracked. In places where reality was more yielding, where a story told and retold, imagination sparked and fear ignited again and again, had softened the walls of reality. Sites of violence and tragedy, where truth was laced with fiction, where a work of art proposed an alternative narrative, something people could suspect to be true, something people felt strongly about, something they feared. The stronger the connection between the belief and emotional response, the better, the darker the better. A ghost of a witch ripping a man's heart from his chest, two brothers murdering the neighbors and hiding their bodies in a well. A young woman haunting the flooded bunker where she drowned. Bedtime stories, folk tales, urban legends connected to a specific place. These were the sites where the overlaps came to be. 
An overlap of the dark place needed a push from both directions to manifest itself. Reality in our world eroded by repeated dark lore tied to a location and a counterpoint. A work of art, a horror narrative crafted in the depths of the dark place, connecting to the story on the other side to reach out through the weakened veil. A story of a lawman whose heart was cut out of his chest. Two corrupt men killed by their own twisted ambition. A haunted old woman drowned in a bathtub. Twisted reflections on the other side of the mirror. Arcs stabbing through realities, amplifying the influence of the dark place. These elements working in conjunction made a trickle that became a torrent, a wormhole, a vortex, and the art, the map, became the nightmare territory where the dark place encroached on our reality, a blanket over it, where they all overlapped, causing reality to twist and loop like a bad dream, remolding anything and anyone within its dark horror design. Animals stayed away from the water's edge as if to avoid some unseen submerged predator waiting just below the dark surface. They never drank the water from the lake. Birds flew around it, never over. Darkness flowed from Cauldron Lake. Gaze in the black mirror of the lake, you'd see it all around you and you'd understand. It was already out, already where you were. It was already too late. Cauldron Lake used to be alive with people, beautiful forests, Hiking trails leading to stunning vistas. Then the government put up a fence. Kept the people out. Volcanic gas, they said. They didn't want anyone knowing the truth. The lake wasn't a lake at all. The dark water a mask to hide the hungry, bottomless ocean below. A fence couldn't stop the flood that was coming. Nothing could. The return of the nightmare rising from the depths. Back at Witch's Ladle. Saga pointed the flashlight at the strange, dark substance. The same substance Nightingale had left at the morgue. There was something hidden under it. She strained to see. The opposite of sunspots in her eyes. Blacker than black. Suddenly a change. The light reacted to the substance. A feedback loop surging up her arm. Saga squeezed the flashlight, willing it to penetrate the dark matter. Burn it away. The fuse was in place. She found it among the junk in the forest. Saga stepped inside the witch's hut. Something rushed through her. A presence. Familiar. She couldn't quite place it. Something long forgotten. She tried to hold on to it. But it was already gone. Inside, a bright light. Saga felt safe. Like nothing could hurt her here. There were objects that stood out to Saga as if the light had manifested them. Pulled them from the darkness. A shift in reality. Heavy with hidden meanings. A coffee thermos. A shoebox. A mop and a bucket. A poster on the wall. And in the cabinet, another manuscript page. Saga edged toward the broken door. Her gun ready. Flashlight aimed ahead. Nightingale said it would be here. The Cauldron Lake General Store was overgrown. Left to rot. Saga thought about the cult of the tree. They'd been here. Waiting. Planning a gruesome ritual murder. Meanwhile, they played cards in the general store, like it was just another late-night poker game. Saga stepped closer to the door. Had the animal broken it? There was a loud crash. Saga found herself face to face with a cultist, a hulking figure in a raincoat. We watch in the night, wild eyes behind a plastic deer mask, an axe in his raised hand. Children in Bright Falls all grew up hearing stories about the cult of the tree. Feral maniacs living in the woods. Satanists chanting, we watch in the night as they perform blood sacrifices in the forests. Or things not quite human lurking in the dark. There were many versions of the story. But they all shared one important element. Danger in the dark. In the woods. Somewhere among all the urban legends lay a secret truth. The real identity of the cultists prowling in the woods. Real faces hid behind the masks. Real hands held the knives. Real people fulfilling a grim purpose. The forest was not safe. People were right to keep their children away from the trees. Witches ladle. Towering over Saga. Watching her and the witch. The image of the witch in the sign. Nightingale's heart, a cold, dead lump in her hand. Her definition of sanity had changed since she arrived in this town. But she trusted the pages was forced to. Saga addressed the witch. She squinted to read the first part of the ritual words. 
the smudged line on the heart. The second part recited from memory, the word she had read on the page. I brought you the heart witch. Show me the terror. Saga pushed the heart through the hole in the sign. This was the key. The tree was the threshold. The writer went into the lake, banished the dark presence. Taken still lurked in the woods. The dark place receded. The current pulled back those with darkness inside, into the lake. Nightingale was there, one of them. The dark presence, Jagger had taken him. The witch had stolen his heart. They sank beneath the waves. The dark place, wandering in the shadows, muttering to themselves. It's dark. I'm lost. Where am I? Who am I? I can't remember. It's cold. Premium cabins for rent in Bright Falls. Who said that? Can you hear me? I need help. Please, stop this. What did I do? You must dig it out. Their shape shifted. Echoes of the writer's dreams. Fading in, fading out. The next story and the story after that. The writer was writing again. He'd been on the trail of the writer forever. The writer despised. Hemingway, Bukowski, Wake. I'll get you. I'll find you. I'll make you pay. You're in over your head. He descended into the tunnels, from the dark city, into the ocean of darkness. Next stop, Caldera Street Station. Something, a presence, rumbled. Not a train. Shadows shifted on the platform. The writer's cult waited for him there. The cult of the word. A cultist leaned close. I carry his words close to my chest now. You're not allowed in the lake until he says otherwise. He'd be caught. Murdered. They got him. They didn't get him. He was reborn out of hate. He was there. But he was risen. Sent to find the light switch up from the lake that was not the lake. Ed hadn't been the same since his latest show had closed. This wasn't the first time one of his productions had shuttered early. Scathing social commentary in a one-act play wasn't exactly filling seats. When Tammy told him she was taking a research trip to Bright Falls, he decided to tag along. Ed told her he wanted to find inspiration. Really, he just wanted a break from the city. But it was true that he certainly needed to find something. A voice. A direction. An idea. Something authentic to himself. Ed knew he couldn't keep using Tammy's money to fund his playwriting. After the argument with Tammy, Ed stormed out of the diner and drove their rental car back to Cauldron Lake to prove a point. Now standing in the dark woods, the sun hidden by the trees, Ed wished he could remember what that point was. Something about masculinity. He cursed at himself and turned to go. Suddenly, he was blinded by a light in his face. Voices shouted and hands pushed him to the ground. Ed struggled, in vain. Tammy tapped her pen on her notebook. Alan Wake had ridden this same ferry into town when he arrived. This was his entry into Bright Falls, his first steps across the threshold. She wrote that down. She always found it helpful to walk in the victim's shoes, do what they did, see what they saw. It added great color to the book. Tammy felt raindrops on her face. God, again? She pulled up her hood. The rain just kept coming. She missed New York. So far, this hadn't been the simple research trip she pictured. First the incident at the lake, then the fight with Ed. It's not surprising tempers got hot. They were both on edge after what had happened. Tammy had said some things. Things she regretted. She looked out over the harbor. A chill passed through her. She hoped Ed wouldn't do anything stupid. When the government seized the land around Cauldron Lake and set up their laboratory there, Ilmo Koskala knew they knew something. Together with his brother, they felt obliged to take a look inside. The Federal Bureau of Control's security was a joke. The Koskalas walked in delivering coffee. Back in Watery, they pored over the stack of files they grabbed. The FBC was researching something in the lake, something they called the Shadow. Everyone who went into the lake came back a monster. Hartman had gone into the lake. He'd come back bad. The FBC had captured him, interrogated him. Based on his ravings, Barbara Jagger had gone into the lake as far back as the 60s. She'd come back bad. The writer, Alan Wake, had gone into the lake, 
He'd face Jagger, push some mystic light switch into a hole in her chest, flick the switch, and gotten rid of her. If Wake ever came back, he was bound to be bad as well. After getting his hands on the FBC files, Ilmo Koskalan knew what he was up against. He masterminded the cult, his and Yako's army, to fight the fucked up horror lurking under the lake, and a plan to keep those feds in their bunker by the lake in the dark. Outsiders would only screw things up. The Koskalas sabotaged the FPC's monitoring station and rigged it to alert them when something was brewing at the lake. One time months later, when the alarm rang, they drove to the lake again, ready for a fight. But this time, they didn't find any monsters. Something else washed ashore. The light switch. They'd read how Wake had stopped Jagger with it in the stolen files. From that point on, whenever the cult caught someone taken over by the shadow, they cut out the monster's heart, pushed the switch into the hole, and flicked it. They're too old to fight monsters. The torchbearers are done. We need something new. Ilmo took a long drag from the joint and handed it to his brother. They'd been drinking and smoking all night. That thing from the lake was not a man and the government's trying to hide it. Ilmo gestured at the files they had stolen from the research station. The strange seal with an upside-down pyramid. The Federal Bureau of Control. We need to keep the feds away. Deal with us our way. We need an army of our own. Yako smiled. He loved to watch his brother come up with his ideas. Ilmo's gaze swam. It was seeing double. The pyramid on the folder was a spruce tree. A tree, he thought. A fucking tree. It was a sign. We'll make the woods scary again. So fucking scary, no one will set foot in them at night. That's how we'll keep people safe. We'll be a legend. We are the cult of the tree, and we watch in the night. We're gonna need scary masks. Energized, Yako chugged a bottle of Ama beer in one go. Ilmo Koskala jolted awake from a nightmare. He was drenched in sweat. In the dream, he'd been covered in blood, gleefully murdering people. His friends. When his twin brother had tried to talk sense into him, he had murdered Yako as well. Ilmo slammed his fist into his temple so hard it hurt. The dream made him feel sick. The dark force of the lake was growing stronger. It was trying to make Ilmo and Yako something they were not. Trying to turn them into Ilmari and Yakopi Huatari from the early days of Watery. But they were the Koskala brothers. Their mother had not raised them to become murderers. They had backbone. They had honor. They had finished Zisu. Something bad was coming. The hidden device they had hooked to the FBC station had been intercepting alarms like crazy the past few days. Ilmo would make sure his cult was ready for war. Out in the night, the story seeking to give birth to an overlap in water he drifted on, looking for another pair of men more prone to corruption. Ilma Koskela stood in front of the small gathering of Coffee World employees and bikers. He read from a piece of paper. Mocha was a wonderful moose who deserves a place of honor in the Hall of the Calavella Knights. His skull will become the crown of the Grand Master. The dead brought back to life. There was polite applause. After the service, Ilmo had the body hauled off to be turned into moose steaks. Mulligan and Thornton were told to get the head cleaned. They both grabbed an antler. What the hell, Thornton? I got it, Mulligan. They brought the skull into the workshop to boil it and bleach it. They grumbled. Wanted to just get it fucking done. It was just a stupid animal. But I guess moose steak is never a mistake, huh? Hey, stop right there. The shape stumbled out of the dark toward Deputy Mulligan. Thornton was doubled over, coughing. A chunk of cold pastrami caught in his throat. Bring it, fucker. Mulligan fired. Thornton hacked the pastrami out of his windpipe, opened fire with his partner. The monster fell. They kept shooting. The thrill of domination. This was the cult of the tree. Not one tree. A forest. Secret knowledge in a deer mask. The last line of defense. yippee ki motherfucker. Bright Falls, fucking finest. They crept over, pulling out their flashlights. The horror. This is Monica from the tackle shop. An innocent woman. Thornton's pastrami came back up. The killing of Monica Thompson was a terrible mistake. Thornton blamed Mulligan's itchy trigger finger. Mulligan blamed Thornton's shitty pastrami sandwich. They only agreed it wasn't their fault. No one will find her corpse. We'll hide it. They fed the body to the maw of a crumbling well. 
like the murderous Huatari brothers did long ago. They lied to everyone. The word would never get out. But a secret like this doesn't die. It grew inside them, like cancer, the darkness taking over, filling the shape of them. Mulligan and Thornton in the wreckage of the morgue, shadows on their faces. Thornton did his best woman's voice. I'm a stuck-up FBI bitch. I'll make a big fucking mess, then get these dumb backwater cops to clean it up. Thornton turned to his partner. These government motherfuckers. Next time, Mulligan, I'll tell her. You got no clue. You let your own kid drown. You're a fucking fraud. Mulligan leered. Pinning the murder on the bookers would have fixed this whole goddamn mess. But their kind always sticks together. I reckon we should show the bitch who's boss, Thornton. Shadows crept over Mulligan and Thornton. Inside them, they grinned. Standing inside the trailer at the outskirts of Watery, Saga had seen Wake's fabled clicker for the first time in the hands of the cult of the tray. Her mind reeled from what the horror story was now claiming about her, her life, her past. She didn't accept it. She stepped out of the trailer. She needed air, but she wasn't alone. A cultist stared at her from behind a deer mask. She drew her weapon, shouted, Ran after him. Saga was beginning to see why Casey disliked the woods so much. They felt oppressive here. Too many places to hide. The distorted carnival music drifting from the amusement park ahead did not help. What the Koskalis had said about her living in Watery with Logan unsettled her. For the horror story to involve her was one thing. But involving her daughter was crossing a line. Something darted across the path ahead. Too fast to see. Saga drew a weapon. Her eyes searched the woods, a noise overhead. Saga swiveled to look, a local, a man on the ridge above her. No, not a man, a monster with a hatchet in each hand. It shouted down at her, hunting season was a bust. What had kept Watery afloat all these years? A century, if not more. The locals knew the answer, grit, or as they put it in the language of their Finnish forefathers, Sisu. These days, Sisu was need more than ever. The town was fading. It never quite recovered from the lumber mill shutting its doors. Now the fishing was drying up as well. Most people had left to find jobs in other towns. Only the most tenacious stubbornly remained. Dug in. Parasites in the body of a terminal patient. Sisu. Some people tried to resuscitate the town. The Koskala brothers double-handedly warded off the impending darkness with their ventures. Coffee World brought tourists, money, and jobs. Coffee-themed fun for all ages. The Kalavala Knights Motorcycle Club built parade floats. The bikers repaired vehicles and volunteered locally. But it wouldn't be enough. Watery needed a miracle. The end of the road was in sight. That was coming fast. Saga had read about it. The trap. She knew what was waiting for her. The moment she saw the giant, she knew she wasn't ready. You let Logan drown. The weapon it carried could crack her skull like a brittle egg, brains leaking out like yolk. Everything she loved, lost. Everything she was, lost. We will watch it eat your mind. Reading this made her sick, but the fear was sharp when she faced it. There was another overlap here in Watery. The parade float was the key. Mulligan and Thornton had gone there, taken the clicker with them, left this monster here to stop her. Ilmo stood in front of the parade float, turned dramatically to his crew. Now, imagine the murderer's arms moving, stab, 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 and then Naki laughing. Everyone at Deerfest always plays it safe, not us. This monument to Watery's history, this work of art will sweep this year's awards. The overlap formed around Watery's dark past. The ritual to enter was tied to crafting the float. Art was the key. It had the power to let Saga in. Dr. Jules Marmont sprinted down the corridor. His lab coat fluttered after him. Red lights flashed on the walls. Sirens screamed. Marmont couldn't stop smiling. It was his experiment that had triggered the alarms. In his world, alarms meant progress. This could be the breakthrough he had been waiting for. He would be the one to get his name in the annals of FBC history. Not his wife, Diana. Not darling, that smirking asshole. At the far end of the corridor, the lights suddenly blinked out. The red lights went dark with increasing speed. 
a wall of darkness rushing toward him. The alarms warbled and died. Marmot stopped in his tracks. He admired the purity of the darkness as it swallowed him. A final spark of pride flashed through his mind. This was his work. His breakthrough. Bailey ran around the corner as the street lamps flickered and went off. It was in front of him, a glitching cloud, a dark, boiling monster. Looking at it felt like what a stroke must feel like. He was sick with fear. He fell. The dark presence ripped into him, swallowed him, filled his lungs and his brains with dark water. Bailey saw a snarling face in the darkness. Then he realized it was his own face. He was snarling. He was standing in the street in the dark, and he was snarling. He was snarling, he snarled. The monster was gone. The darkness coiled around him in tatters and wisps. He was the monster now filled with rage. He was the monster now filled with rage, he shouted. Sorry, we're at a Bright Falls blend, Anna apologized to the customers. I'll just grab some from the back. More coffee coming right up. She suggested they ride the percolator while they waited. She passed Ilmo at the Espresso Express. Big smile, Anna. Coffee world is all smiles. Anna nodded, smiled. She smiled until her face hurt. Anna stopped walking, realized she was standing next to the Huatari well. Must have zoned out, she thought. She was about to go, but something in the well caught her eye, a shadow shifting in the dark. Anna was overcome by vertigo. The world tilted, and then she was falling down, down, down into the shaft. The darkness opened up to swallow her. Scratch stalked through the forest, a terrifying dark presence in the night, more sensed than seen. Darkness boiled in his skull, like a storm cloud crammed into a bottle. The woods were alive with those he had taken. They were coming with him, directed by him, his army of darkness. His singular purpose was a sharp, pulsing black hole in his head, waves roaring out of it to whip his flock into a frenzy, filling them with his purpose. The clicker. He wanted it, to make his horrific ending to the story come true. The art was there. The clicker would push it across the final threshold, a detonator to send out a tidal wave that would spread to overtake reality. He was so close to claiming it. The Taken gibbered and shouted, straining against their invisible leashes, filled with bloodlust. Scratch let them go. They launched themselves into the night with violent glee. He ripped a signpost from the ground, swung it in his hands as if it was made of air. Ahead, the music started. It called him on. Let the final deer fest commence. Ilmo was nervous. His palms were clammy. He lowered his phone. Mulligan isn't picking up. Yako shook his head, pointed at his own phone. Same with Thornton. Ilmo didn't like it. No one was answering the phone at the workshop in Watery either. Something was up. It had to be the writer. Had to be. The Coscula brothers were crouching in the bushes across from the Elderwood Palace Lodge, its light shining in the night. They couldn't wait any longer. The brothers knew Saga was in Watery visiting her trailer. Going now was their only chance to do this without hurting her. Ilmo stood up and a crowd of deer masks looked his way. Okay, this is it. The writer is the target. Take him down and it's all over. Only shoot the fed if you have to. This is our big moment. We watch in the night. The crowd murmured the chant back to him. Ilmo turned his face to the hotel. He could see Saga's partner in the window. Ilmo slapped his brother on the shoulder. The brothers donned their masks. The cult of the tree was ready. Saga had slid into a nightmare. A growing amount of evidence said her daughter was dead. Saga couldn't accept that. Wake said it could be undone. But Wake was gone, in the custody of the Federal Bureau of Control. Casey, her only ally, was gone too. She was alone. Agent Estevez had pulled rank on her, stonewalled her, shut her out of her own case. Saga refused to give up. She needed answers. Tor and Odin Anderson would have some. A family visit, then. No one could blame her for that. Saga was trapped in a horror story. It was manifesting itself around her like the darkness of a mental illness, pushing her deeper and deeper. The Valhalla Nursing Home, founded in 2014 for Odin and Tor Anderson of the Old Gods of Asgard fame. 
for their twilight years. Built after the return comeback tour. Flip-flop to be their farewell tour. Cut short. Cancelled. As their agent, Barry Wheeler had managed to coax a few hit songs out of them before that. Balance Lays the Demon. Couple of others. The old men rocked like their namesakes. The backstage parties got out of hand. The air was thick with smoke. Wheeler squinted. His migraine flared, booze and drugs. A rock and roll cliche. They ran off after every gig. Wheeler had security track them down to the craziest after parties. Wheeler used to be the agent of a manic depressive celebrity writer, Alan Wake. Wake had various addictions on his back. An on-off death wish. Wheeler had seen a thing or two. Wheeler paid a lot of money for a good shrink. Got himself convinced that all the nightmares he'd seen leading up to Wake drowning himself were just his imagination. PTSD. Now we had pills to keep the shadows from his sleep. But the Andersons were something else. The nightmares were starting to creep in again. Or maybe it was the drugs in the air. Wheeler hoped it was the drugs. The Andersons were so old. Vampires. After every gig in the party that followed, it took them weeks to bounce back. And they never did completely. Each time Wheeler expected them to croak. Barry Wheeler canceled the Old Gods tour. Called it off. It was over. He couldn't stomach the idea of another client dying on him. Wheeler set up a foundation with the sales of their greatest hits album. He used the cash to build a nursing facility. The old men deserved it. An old manor in Bright Falls. Wheeler hired a contractor to have it refitted as an old folks' care home. At this point, Wheeler felt good about himself. He had a heart of gold. No need to feel guilty. Wheeler left the work to the contractor and returned to New York City. He had done his part. It was time to turn over a new leaf. The contractors figured out Wheeler was gone for good. They took the money and ran. When the fall rains came, the leaks started appearing. Every night was bingo night at the Valhalla Nursing Home. Each time Rose drew a ball from the cage and called out its numbers, some of the residents shouted bingo, no matter what was on their cards. Some of them sat mute their cards full, never calling out. Some of them would try to steal the ball from her. Some of them would chastise the others for acting out. It was like herding a clouder of cats. Rose didn't mind. She liked cats. She knew she was where she was supposed to be, with her little Vikings, waiting for the hero to come. Tonight, the residents were restless, more so than usual. Ati was wearing Blum's coveralls again. Tor stood by the phone. Too late. Rose saw the hammer in his hand. The garden lights started to flicker, the darkness and rain pressing against the windows. The time drew nigh. Tor Anderson had lightning in his veins. This was rock and roll, baby. That weaver girl had cast a spell on him. Tor would do anything she'd ask. Tor deserved this. Tor wanted this. She wanted the song. A gift. He had to get it for her. Afterwards, it was too late. Tor swung his hammer in frustration. The spark was gone. Black liquid clogged his mind. A bad trip. Tor fought it. He was strong. He'd never be taken. But the darkness could still drown him. Tor needed to warn someone. It was all happening again. Tom was back. Coming back. Tom would need help too if he was going to make it. But the brothers were too old to stop at this time. Tor had called someone. Someone who could help. The name escaped him, drowned beneath dark water. Odin Anderson stirred in his bed, his vision hazy, smudged. He felt weighted down by an ocean of dark water. Through the haze, he made out Saga. Odin felt useless. He wished he could tell Saga how his silly faces made her smile when she was young, too young to remember. Odin used to joke that Tor was her grandfather, but he was the all-father. He smiled at the memory. Odin was the kinder of the Anderson brothers. Tor lacked patience, more volatile. The brothers fought a lot, but they were inseparable. Now Tor was missing, dragged into darkness. Odin could feel it. Time was running out for both of them. It's 1988, a face-off between deities on the rim of Cauldron Lake, high above its dark waters. Thunder roared, the old gods facing something even more powerful. Something harder to define, even. Or, changing the perspective, raving lunatics all.
caught up in the frenzy of a shared delusion. The old gods, the corsairs of the Sea of Night, and the Dark One who yearned to stand in between, who had always stood in between, who would soon stand in between. We help you, you stay away from our family, Tor Anderson snarled over the thunder. Yes, until you all come to me, came the answer. That's never going to happen, shouted Odin. I will take this as collateral, shall you remember our deal, said the Dark One. Blood arched from Odin's face as he fell to his knees. Lightning hit the dark figure on the cliff, and with that, he was gone. Tor rushed to his brother. Are you all right, bro? Effectively blind in that moment, the eye patch covering his left eye, his hand over the now empty socket of his right, blood oozing out of it. Odin cursed. The bastard took the wrong eye. Rose woke up from another dream from her idol. Another message. All through her morning routine, she was humming happily. So happily, she realized she was starting to forget what Alan had told her. Something about a hero who would come to save them all. And the hero... Rose frowned. This won't do, Rose Marigold. You know better than to forget. Something about knitwear. The hero... liked it? Rose nodded, determined. She'd use the knitwork to guide the hero to the secret stashes she had hid in the forest to help them. Knitwear to mark the spot. Alan will love that, she thought. Now she only needed the knitwork. Rose thought hard. Mandy May was always knitting. Mandy May would help her. When Cynthia Weaver was downstairs at breakfast, Rose snuck into her room. With all the lamps in the room, it took her a while to find the one with an angel. Luckily, the dream Alan had sent her had been very clear. Rose was certain that Cynthia would not miss one lamp. She had so many. Tonight, Rose would put the lamp in a shoebox and let it sink into the garden pond. That's what Alan wanted. That's how she could help him. The thought made her whole body buzz with joy. Cynthia Weaver hated being old. She'd been a doer. A fighter. Now the bathroom frightened her. Afraid she'd break her hip. Like Norman. Cynthia had always kept her lantern close. To hold the darkness at bay. Oh dear. My lantern. I think I've lost it. Cynthia said. This will put a smile back on your face, my dear. A voice said. A man's voice. Someone in the bathroom with her. In the dark. The light bulb had blown. She meant to replace it days ago. How could she forget? She had slipped getting out of the tub. She lay in the tub now. She lifted her hand. It looked wrong. Too many hands. In a black void with no sense of up or down. She was underwater. A dark shape pushed her down. Dark water pressed itself into her. She screamed. It came out in bubbles. Cynthia Weaver smiled. Lost without her lantern? Nonsense. Cynthia felt as giddy as a young girl in love. Cynthia had loved Thomas Zane. Tom only had eyes for Barbara. Barbara was bad news. Tom had seen it in the end. Cynthia had been there to comfort him. And when he left, Cynthia waited. Years of waiting. Now Tom had come back to her. They'd be together now. See the world. She'd always dreamed of seeing New York. They were there now in a fancy hotel. She drew a bath. She would become like Barbara. No. Better. She sank into dark water. Into Tom. Tom had enemies plotting against him. Cynthia would deal with the nasty Anderson fellow, Tor, always poking people with his hammer. He had it coming. Anything for Tom. Emmett Elwood had had enough. All his life he'd been surrounded by the same small-minded, impolite, ignorant people in town. Their endless gossip, their nose-picking, chewing food with their mouths open, not washing their hands after visiting the restroom, and touching things. Touching everything. The world was going to hell. He'd watched day after day how all the nice things in life in Bright Falls were spoiled and ruined forever. There would be a just and terrible reckoning. Emmett had imagined many times how he'd make them pay. He had lovingly tended his anger, made it grow hotter. It was out in the open now. Ugly and slobbering, they reached at him with their unwashed hands. He'd beat them down, beat them until they no longer moved. And then he'd wash his hands with a strong antibacterial disinfectant. Gail Burrows stared at his chest x-ray. 
It was in his left lung. It felt like a black hole, an opening to darkness. He felt like he was drowning. He coughed and coughed and coughed. So hard his whole body and soul felt twisted and mangled, upside down and inside out. With every cough, the black hole grew bigger. It felt good. It tore him up, but it felt good. Gale was dying. The black hole was sucking everything good out of him. He imagined looking through it, into the darkness. The black hole grinned. Gale couldn't escape its gravity. He worshipped it. Gale sacrificed to it. In blood. Saga jabbed the selector on the jukebox. The missing record in its place. Saga couldn't have found it without Odin's help. Standing there, Saga felt exposed. Expecting the shadows to come alive. The needle crackled on the vinyl. The song swelled. Odin had said it was written for her and her mother. Her grandfather's apology. The lamentation of an old man. His heart was broken, sinking into darkness. Odin had said that the song would be a way to know Tor. A way to find him. A light bloomed in through the garden window. That's where Tor had vanished into the pond. Saga knew what she had to do. Agent Young held his clipboard up to the light. The equipment was all accounted for. He ticked the boxes, satisfied. A noise on the other side of the back lot made him pause. He peered into the darkness. Nothing. Shrugging, he signed and dated the form. Estevez wanted everything ready, just in case. Young appreciated a cautious leader. Estevez had held it together even after the oldest house had gone dark. Young began to head inside. The local sheriff's station was a tight fit, but at least they had a coffee machine. Young felt optimistic. They even had the para-utilitarian in custody already. Another clatter behind him. Closer this time. He turned, hand on his holster. He called out to the darkness. This station has been seized by the Federal Bureau of Control. You're not authorized to be here. Suddenly, the lights flickered, went off. Young couldn't see a thing. Then from inside the station, the screams began. The surface of the lake was a black mirror. The upside-down reflection identical yet darker. A window into a darker world than ours. A doorway. A hush so profound it rang like a scream. As if the last echo of the terror had just died. Inside the steep cliffs of the caldera, everything echoed. An echo chamber. Like a fractured skull. A shadow fell on Cauldron Lake. Something of impossible scale loomed over it, blocking the sky. Ati, the janitor, leaned close. Took a hold of the rim of the crater. Lifted up his janitor's bucket. The water sloshed. Swirled inside like a vortex. Gently humming a tango. He poured the water on the attic floor. Borland Dor walked across the rain-slick tiles of Caldera Street Plaza. The rain didn't seem to touch him. He sensed his steps were being observed, documented into the story. He allowed it, this one time for this one reason, to be passed on by his unwilling disciple, to read at the right time. The ocean that was the dark place took the shape of New York City, drawn for the mind of Alan Wake, in part for the writer to navigate his prison, in part to torment him as he struggled to find his way out. Dor was not bound by the rules as Wake was. He came and went as he pleased. For now, Dor entertained the writer's fantasy, for a purpose known only to him. At the edge of the plaza, he stopped at the door to the construction yard. A poster for his talk show hung there, another part of Wake's fiction. He stepped through, willing it to take him to Parliament Tower Plaza. The writer of the first word, not the writer of the last with the terror of the light and the shadow cast. The third eye now open to project the night. This is the moment to write. This is the ritual to lead you on. Your friends will meet him when you are gone. Lost on the shore between the forest and the ocean, the owl and the deer reflected in motion. In his room he will hurt her. In hers he is caught. His story ends. Her story does not. This is the ritual to lead you on. Your friends will meet him when you are gone.
A pale balloon in the sky float and sink deeper. Night springs when bright falls for this sleeper. The surface disturbed, the reflection now a traitor. In the cavity of the skull, turned to a crater. This is the ritual to lead you on. Your friends will meet him when you are gone.